हेलो From all over India, first I welcome to one and all. I would like to welcome to Dr. Kalyani Ma'am and Dr. B. R. Borke Sir, principal of my college. I am glad to introduce Dr. Kalyani Ma'am, today's inaugurator of One Day International Inc. Conference on Diasporic Literature. I have <clears throat> a huge li uh, a huge list of Ma'am's introduction. I uh, selected some of uh, them. Uh, in academic qualification, ma'am has uh, achieved a first class nearby uh, 72 percent of marks. May I go, sir? Yes, yes, sir, yes, sir. Go, go ahead, go ahead. Ma'am, I have I has achieved a first class of seventy two percent of marks in MA uh, in English language and literature in nineteen ninety eight from the Institution of English University of Kerala. Uh, Ma'am has uh, successfully cracked the UG Senate uh, with GRF in December nineteen ninety eight ninety nine. Sorry. Uh, Maya, Maya has uh, conducted research at the University of British Columbia, Canada from 2003 to 2004. Uh, Maya has uh, awarded the PhD degree in, nine, uh, in 2008 by the University of Kerala, Trivandrum. Awards and uh, distinctions. Maya has honored as a uh, distinguished woman uh, entrepreneur by the Alama. Doctor Research Fellowship for Academy Year 2003. Ma'am has granted the Ministry for Human Resource Development Scholarship by the Government of India for postgraduate studies. She has attended the UGC Junior Research Fellowship uh, GRF with NET in December 1999. In professional uh, experiences, uh, cross cultural workshop has been organized by ma'am on uh, 20th October 2023. As a cross cultural workshop also organized by ma'am on uh, 18th October 2023. As well as uh, <clears throat> organized a game based on 5th. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Anand Somasar, for Somasar, for introducing uh, Dr. Kalani Mullat, ma'am. Uh, I think he is having a poor network connection. Uh, I would like to introduce Dr. Kalani Mullat, ma'am. Uh, ma'am has started uh, Wallat State in Trivandrum, Kerala at Patam Palace, where I have studied uh, more than four and five hundred students, more, more than thousand students. They all studied at uh, Vallad Space at uh, Trivandrum, Kerala. And uh, more than 500 or 600 students, they have cleared their debt, uh, set, net, and GRF. And all are uh, all of them are working as an assistant professor. Uh, some of them are Gajanan Junzari, working, as Mah working at Mahur. Uh, then Tulshiram Bhoyar. Uh, then uh, I am also, Dr. Prabhakar Swami, working here at Mahatma Phule. Uh, mo most of the students of MAM, uh, they have cleared uh, set, uh, set net and GRF uh, from all over the our country. Uh, so we have, I will not take much more time between you and MAM. So I heartily welcome Dr. Kalani Vallad, MAM. Uh, please guide us on diasporic literature and importance of this subject uh, for the set net and GRF. You can tell about your Vallad test also. So we are eagerly waiting for you. Thank you. Thank you. I am very privileged that 
you invited me to this great gathering. I am extremely sorry that I kept you all waiting for some time because I was under the wrong notion that it is at 4.30 that the program starts. I was sitting here with my books reading for the lecture. I did not uh, check my messages. I'm terribly sorry. <laughs> um, no, no, no problem. No problem. <laughs> so uh, today I'm going to talk about diasporic writings, uh, concepts and contexts. I have a presentation, but before we move into my presentation, uh, dear friends, remember that we are all inhabiting a world that is incre increasingly plural. Even when globalization has brought together our world in different ways, we are all able to uh, make our voices heard. We are all able to have a democratic space in this society. When we talk about uh, cultural pluralism or cultural plurality, it means that nobody is minority anymore. Every minority group is able to participate fully in the dominant society because of various reasons. Because first and foremost, we have got technology. We have uh, changes in the realms of socio-political uh, realities. So while maintaining cultural differences, uh, all cultural groups, major and minor, minor and major, are able to uh, make their voices heard. We know that our country, India, is the ultimate example of cultural plurality, uh, cultural pluralism, the differences between all our cultures from Kashmir to Kanyakumari, from Arunachal Pradesh to Gujarat. That is the uh, hallmark of India's national identity. Cultural plurality, what do you mean by that? It is the principle uh, where a lot of different cultures exist together, maintaining their difference, uh, yet uh, being one whole at the same time. This is the nature of many democratic countries in the world, the many countries of Europe or South Africa and so on, India being one of the major uh, countries where there is cultural pluralism. Cultural pluralism is different from multiculturalism. Uh, pluralism allows for different groupings. At the same time, they don't, uh, cultural plural countries or situations do not impose uh, a unity on these communities. Communities maintain their differences. Uh, since time of immemorial, the uh, lifestyle, the food habits, the festivals of Maharashtra, for example, have remained unique and un, uh, to a large extent unchanged. Uh, they are very different from those of Kerala or Karnataka or any other part of India. So this is called cultural pluralism. Uh, it is also a reality today that almost all countries of the world have opened up their boundaries to diasporic communities. We have all uh, changed. We are no longer pure nations, you know, where ethnic communities uh, live. Every country in the world uh, includes also diasporas or people from other parts of the world. The diasporic communities represent and maintain a culture different from those of the other countries. Uh, for example, take a country like Canada or Australia. We have people from all parts of the world there, including Indians. The Indians remain Indians to a large extent, or they be, be, remain as Indo-Canadians. Uh, there is no Canadian as such. Everybody is a, an Indo-Canadian or Scandinavian Canadian or Japanese Canadian or some hyphenated identity they have. So diaspora is the reality of the world. Every country is full of diasporic people. And uh, these diasporic people maintain a strong relationship with their own parent country from the with the countries of their origin or the cultures of their origin. And they also mingle with the new cultures. They uh, maintain a, a, a dual identity in this sense. So today, I am very happy to talk to you about uh, diaspora, diasporic writings, the literatures of these communities, diasporic writings, concepts, and contexts. It is a captivating 
and profoundly influential aspect of literature because literature is no longer the literature of one culture, one pure culture, as I told you, it always includes many cultures and many perspectives. So diasporic writings, that genre, which came into being in the post-war world after the Second World War today uh, is a very rich tapestry of stories and experiences and uh, ideological perspectives of uh, communities from across the world. And they, these are very plural communities, not singular, but plural, towards a very tolerant world where every voice is heard, where everybody is living together. Diasporic literature contributes a, uh, to a great extent. Uh, it represents a very diverse literary landscape that reflects the complexities, the struggles, the diverse experiences of individuals uh, who are navigating the intricate paths of displacement and identity. So what is our identity? What is How is it related to our territoriality? How is it related to our roots and our past? Where are we going in our future? These are all very complicated questions today that lie at the core of diasporic literature. Diasporic literature is a celebration of diversity. This is a very typical picture of diaspora. The dandelion flower with its seeds dispersed across the world, as all of you uh, would be aware, is the picture of diaspora. It is a celebration. Diasporic literature is a celebration of diversity. It is a testament to how human spirit uh, is resilient. We don't get defeated. We only change. Nobody gets wiped out. No culture gets dominated by another completely. Every culture changes in relation to other cultures. We become hybrid cultures. So diasporic literature talks about the narratives of individuals who have been uh, uprooted from their homelands. They have to leave their homelands for some reason. They are forced to navigate unfamiliar territories in some other part of the world. They, they are thrown into uh, new lifestyles, new food habits. For example, Prabhagar Swami, uh, Professor Prabhagar Swami was talking about how he came to Kerala and uh, stayed here for one year. It was a time when around 50 Maharashtrians were there in Kerala attending my course. All of them, I was, I used to joke with them, are diasporic Maharashtrians in Kerala. And like a micro, microcosm of the diasporic experience, all of them struggled with our big, big rice. We eat big rice in Kerala. They struggled with our coconut oil. They struggled with our climate. They were always remembering Maharashtra. They were remembering their Maharashtrian food. I, I used to tell them, now you must value, value the food that your mother cooks. Because when you are at home, uh, you don't always value it. You long for what is not yours. You long for the new, the adventurous. But it is when you leave your comfort zone of home that you really understand how much you're connected to your home. So this is a very... Um, unique experience uh, that diasporic communities have. They write stories about this kind of um, hybrid experience. Their stories resonate deeply, transcending geographical boundaries and resonating with anybody who ever felt displacement from home in any way. So uh, there are Indian diasporic people across the world. They have left India for various reasons, some in search of jobs, some to escape persecution, some because their families, uh, they get intermarried there and their families lie in both India and abroad. And for various reasons like that, uh, there are many di diasporas in the world, not just one, innumerable diasporas in the world. I will first talk about the major concerns of diasporic literature. Then we will talk about the different kinds of diasporas and we will have an overview of diasporic literature. Diaspora is deeply connected with the concept of transnationalism across nations. Today we are, in a, we are living in a globalized age where our um, capital money is global, global capital, where our media is global media, where our ideologies are global ideologies, our 
um, technology is global technology and people are also global. We have become very mobile. We are traveling from one country to the other, from place to place. So what is transnationalism? Transnationalism is the process and activities that take place outside a nation boundaries, a nation's boundaries. Much of India lies outside the boundaries of India. The Indians of Fiji or Philippines or uh, Europe or Canada or UK or uh, United States or Australia. If you take a look at their numbers, there might be even more than the people who live within India itself. There are such a big diasporic community that lies beyond the nation state. So we are a transnational community. It refers to the movement of individuals, of course, but not only individuals. It refers to the movement of goods. The, it refers to the movement of ideas and concepts and cultures across national boundaries. Today, sitting in India, we are able to enjoy uh, American food. We are able to enjoy, so in some parts of India, even Japanese or Chinese food, uh, media. Also, we are consuming media from all over the world. So uh, it is a globalized world, a transnational world, where uh, the boundaries are becoming more and more permeated. They are porous. We are a community that is interdependent. We have inter-regional relationships. Transnationalism can also be economic. It can be seen in terms of economics because we have economic globalization today. Uh, our money that is spent in infrastructure building in India or uh, developing uh, human resource in India is very often money that comes from other countries. And in return for teaching us various things, in return for giving us various things, we have to give something back in return also to those countries. This interdependence involves power. This in interdependence involves exploitation also. Uh, it is a very complex phenomenon. It is not very simple. So in terms of these cultural exchanges of capital, labor, information, ideology, uh, thanks to the advance in, uh, advances in technology and communications, uh, as well as transportation, we have a global economy now that is increasingly fluid, that is increasingly challenging uh, the traditional concepts of uh, identity, of territory, of sovereignty. In other words, we are not free anymore. We are ruled over by many other countries of the world uh, because of these transnational developments. Diasporic communities often act as a channel. The, the diasporic communities means the Indians in diaspora, the Indians living in other parts of the country. Why is uh, why why are there Indian rulers in the USA and uh, UK? We have an Indian woman who is in a top uh, ruling position in America. We have an Indian man, uh, Rishi Shunak in UK. Why are they ruling there? Because uh, this transnational connections between countries is very complicated. These diasporic people often act as a channel for the transfer of power, for the transfer of uh, language and traditions and values, for the language of uh, cosmopolitanism as well as cultural diversity. So this, uh, this is the introduction to um, uh, diaspora and diasporic literature. Now let me talk to you about some of the basic ideas of diasporic literature, some of the basic defining concerns of diasporic literature. When we talk about diaspora and diasporic literature, we Indians always begins with Salman Rishti because he is the first major writer uh, of post-colonial literature, who is also diasporic and he documented diasporic ideas and experiences a lot. Salman Rushdie's uh, fiction is one on the one side. I will talk about that later. But Salman Rushdie's non-fiction or critical essays are very important. His essay collection from 1991 uh, titled Imaginary Homelands. It has become a very important catchword in diasporic studies. It explores this essay, this book essay, as well as the book explores various topics related to culture, diaspora, literature, and politics, and show that uh, diasporic communities have an imaginary connection that is sustained by literature and national symbols, etc., with their original uh, homeland. 
so these writers are ambassadors of their culture. Using his own personal experiences as an Indian immigrant living in the West uh, as a rationale, Salman Rezdi explores concepts like exile, migration, and the idea of home. The essay, Imaginary Homelands, very, uh, very significantly begins with an old photograph. He describes an old photograph from his past. And for all of us, we know that photographs define uh, our past. They denote memory and nostalgia, which are very key uh, ideas related to the diasporic uh, experience. The idea of belonging to not one culture, but several cultures, and the quest for identity in a world defined by cultural pluralism and globalization, as well as displacement. That is what he means by the title, imaginary homelands. The diasporic people do not have one single homeland. Wherever they go, they experience and carry with them these experiences of um, these memories of displacement and deterritorialization. Uh, to use a term used by N.G. Vasanji, uh, they, they are citizens of no new lands. There are, there are uh, different there are different countries that the protagonist of No New Land is traveling to and living, but everywhere he experiences displacement and alienation. So as you all know, Rushdie, uh, diasporic writers were not considered important and prominent. Uh, they were not considered mainstream until Salman Rushdie and writers like that came into the scenario. Uh, Rushdie gained international recognition with the release of his novel Midnight's Children in 1981, for which he was nominated uh, for, uh, for the Booker Prize. He went on to win the Booker of Bookers and other many other awards uh, in later years. In his works, Rushdie often explores the intricacies of cultural identity, which is not at all easy. It is conflict ridden and also the challenges of reconciling multiple identities. In novels like The Moor's Last Sigh, uh, Shame, uh, or uh, many of the later novels, you can see these, Shalimar the Clown, you can see examples of this. His own experiences, as well as his uh, scholarship and research on migration, displacement and clash of cultures have had a major impact on his writings, which I will talk about presently. Diasporic identities are susceptible to change. As I already mentioned, they are not static. Diaspora is continuously changing because when we come in contact with other cultures, the elements of those cultures um, in a dialectical manner connect with ours and form a new third culture. So the diasporic people attempt to adjust to diverse experiences while also searching for their identity. So theirs is a new identity. It is not an Indian who lives in America or Canada is not uh, an Indian like an Indian who lives in India. They are definitely hyphenated. They are uh, definitely uh, in possession of a complex identity. The compromise between uh, these different fluid, changeable identities. You know, you are uh, inhabiting a fluid identity in this case. It can be resolved through transcultural uh, relationships. Uh, in order to uh, understand the ties between people and the nation state, there are many uh, writers who have embarked on uh, uh, writing about it, for example, Partha Chatterjee, Partha Chatterjee, Deepesh Chakravarti, Shahid Amin, etc., are very important writers who are themselves diasporic, who have written about the relationship between people and the nation state and nationalism. Uh, so the diasporic people, they are aware of uh, placing themselves within an international cultural scenario. Somewhat like T.S. Eliot said that the individual talent should be consciously placed within the matrix of uh, tradition. So this search for identity in a world is an unending quest because precisely because it is not one single concept of identity that we are pursuing, but the, our identity is a process. That is why in post-structuralism, post-colonialism and diasporic writing, we have the expression, we are not in a state of being, but becoming. We are in a state of becoming. 
Now, the idea of becoming or identity as a process is inextricably related to the concept of hybridity. It is Homi K. Baba who talked about uh, identity of the post-colonial subject or the diasporic subject as hybrid and in inhabiting what is called the third space. According to Homi Baba, the two dynamics of colonialism and post-colonialism have resulted in a blending of cultural forms. We are all inevitably hybrid, even though uh, some of us may not have moved out of our nation. We may not have done international travel. We may not have lived abroad. We are still hybrid because we carry within us memories of uh, British culture in India. We consume a lot of international media and cultures from across the world. So we are inevitably hybrid. One of the common experiences of uh, the diasporic colonized subject is his uh, hybridity, where there are uh, two, at least two elements within one identity, the element of the colonizer and the colonized, the element of the host culture and the element of the um, uh, new culture, the new culture that is mingling with the host culture, the immigrants culture. So writers who are immigrants or foreigners create writing uh, that address hot issues such as nationalism, because it is not one thing. Uh, it is very plural. Hybridity is entailing the concept of plurality. Uh, issues like nationalism, sexuality, families, how it relates to uh, the individual. Third space is the liminal, in-between, interstitial space that lies between two cultures. Uh, it is the space where two cultures clash, collide, and negotiate. Homi Baba talked about it. So uh, uh, a diasporic subject is necessarily inhabiting a third space. And one of the most important uh, aspects of diasporic literature is the way in which is its ability to bridge the two spaces, to bridge the gaps, to bridge uh, the differences between the two cultures, uh, fostering understanding and empathy among readers. Through the pages of uh, diasporic novels um, or poetry or narratives, uh, we gain slowly an understanding of this interstitial space, this hybrid space, we gain an understanding of the challenges faced by those who have experienced cultural dislocation, how traditions and identities clash, giving rise to new hybrid identities. We are transported into worlds where languages serve both as a bridge and a barrier. A language can be a bridge connecting two people. It can also be a barrier where the struggle for belonging unfolds in very uh, poignant and complicated ways. So that is one important, another important aspect of diasporic literature. The next important aspect I would talk to you about is nostalgia and memory. Nostalgia and memory are recurring themes in diasporic writing, as we are well aware. Experiences of diaspora include intense feelings of uh, uprooting from our parent culture uh, and a sense of rootlessness. Early diasporic writers like Bharati Mukherjee have written about it uh, uh, ad nauseum. They, they have completely continuously talked about this sense of dislocation and rootlessness. While home still serves as a catalyst or reflection of the, of the past, nostalgic feelings can also develop without a desire to return home. You don't want to return home, you want to live there. For example, the protagonist in Bharati Mukherjee's Jasmine. Uh, for example, in uh, Monica Ali's Brick Lane, you see that Nazneen decides to stay there. She does not want to return home. Uh, exile, trial, and homecoming, these are the three aspects of diasporic experience that our Partha Sarathi talked about. But homecoming is not always possible because you have completely changed by the time uh, you survive in the West for some years. There is no coming back for many people. So uh, nostalgic feelings can evoke experience that, that experiences that alter a person's identity. An individual's identity can completely change because of nostalgia in the and experiences in the host country. And there are uh, very significant differences between first generation diasporic writers and second generation diasporic writers, which can be very well 
uh, understood and explained with the, uh, with the example of the namesake by Jhumpa Lahri. You know that in the namesake, Ashok and Ashima are first generation immigrants who are finding it very difficult to, uh, to survive in their new culture. Whereas Gogol, their son, is able to, uh, he is rejecting his tradition at first and he's able to assimilate into host culture. But eventually he realizes uh, that his uh, identity lies in his roots with India as well. Many first generation migrants wrote about their homeland since that is where they felt most home. Many, uh, you know, first generation African writers, for example, still write about Africa. Uh, they, the first generation Africans write about Africa because they feel uh, more African than British or American. They are unable to process their newfound experiences in their host countries. There is a, a word for homecoming. I told you, our, our Partha Sarathi and others have talked about homecoming. There is a beautiful word for homecoming. It is called poetics of return. Home and poetics of return. These are very important concepts. Uh, poetics of return refers to the way in which the idea of coming back to one's homeland or ancestral homeland after being displaced uh, is explored or represented. How this homecoming happens. This is especially important for diasporic communities where people have had to struggle uh, in the West for some time and then they come home to their gods at home. Mina Alexander's A House of a Thousand Doors is a case in point. Uh, you know, by the time, uh, think of things fall apart. By the time uh, Okonkwo comes home from Mbanta, he was exiled to Mbanta. By the time he comes home from Mbanta, the host culture had irredeemably changed. The uh, culture of uh, umofia had changed completely. So this is a very important aspect of diasporic writing. They experience cultural shock. The idea of return uh, to home culture has strong emotional and symbolic significance for diasporic populations. It expresses a wide range of desires and aspirations, fears, what will happen when I go back home Will I experience the same culture as before the tensions of coming back? Because by the time the diasporic people come back, they have also aged. Their uh, life has also changed uh, irreparably. So it's about finding your place in the world and balancing the experiences of being displaced uh, as well as wanting to belong. So this reminds us that diasporic people are always like refugees. This is why diasporic literature have today joined hands with refugee literature or asylum literature also. We are, uh, diasporic people are like refugees seeking to belong. We know that a lot of films also show diasporic experiences. In diasporic literature, films, musicals and all cultural forms, the idea of return uh, is connected uh, to this, uh, the, the, the complications of returning, rediscovering one's roots. The narratives may portray the difficulties and intricacies of coming back home. You can again uh, see this in M.G. Vasanji or um, Bharati Mukherjee or uh, Jhumpa Lahri, the feeling of alienation and displacement. At the end of Brick Lane by Monica Ali, uh, Chanu is uh, a Bangladeshi British uh, man who is returning home he is deciding to return home because for him, return is better than staying in the host country. But Nazneen is not returning home. Now, in the seminal work, Global Diasporas, uh, we are coming to diasporic writers now. Uh, in the seminal work, Global Diasporas, it's a very important work by Robin Cohen. Uh, he talks about different kinds of diasporas. I don't believe in having a PowerPoint presentation throughout because uh, the the magic of speaking to you, the magic of uh, gesturing and the magic of facial expressions is lost uh, in a PowerPoint. So I have just used the PowerPoint for the ideas. When I talk about stories and people, I would, I would like to uh, speak to you without the PowerPoint. 
uh, I was saying that Robin Cohen has talked about uh, five kinds of diasporas. The five kinds are victim diasporas, labor diasporas, imperial diasporas, trade diasporas, and deterritorialized diasporas. Don't worry, I will talk to them, talk to you about them one by one in some detail. Victim diaspora means people who have spread all over the world because they were victimized. The very beginning of uh, the United States uh, was the victim diaspora of the Pilgrim Fathers who came from James I, England, and uh, they took refuge in New England. The biggest of the victim diasporas in the world may be the Jewish diaspora, resulting from Babylonian exile uh, and later the Holocaust also during the Second World War. The D Jewish diaspora has spread all over the world and they have woven a rich uh, tapestry in their works. A rich history has been documented in their works. Their works are religious, historical, and also literary. The major works of the Jewish diaspora include the Bible itself. It is very uh, significant that today, uh, the day before Easter and the day after uh, our um, Good Friday, we are talking about the Jewish diaspora. And the biggest, the most important of their religious text is the Bible itself that emerged from the Jewish diaspora and became Christianity. We know that a lot of Holocaust literature, for example, the Diary of a Young Girl by Anne Frank, the Night Trilogy by Elie Wiesel, these are all very important texts of the Jewish Holocaust uh, diaspora. Uh, Edward Said, if you talk about Palestinian di diaspora, the, because of the war between the other side of the Jewish um, victimization is the Jewish oppression of the Palestinians. On They have been on both sides. So it, the, a lot of Palestinians have also fled from uh, Palestine and Gaza, and they have also started uh, writing a lot. Edward Said has written a very seminal work, After the Last Sky, Palestinian Lives. That is not a critical work. It is a testimonies of Palestinian people. It is a significant contribution to the Palestinian diaspora. Talk about criticism. A very important book of victim diaspora is the book by Paul Gilroy, Black Atlantic, um, Modernity and Double Consciousness, where Paul Gilroy argues that mm, the black, black people have been, uh, because of slavery, spread across the Atlantic. They are there in Africa, in Europe, in America, everywhere across the Atlantic, you see the black communities. And Paul Gilroy suggests that they are a nation in itself. So that shared culture of the black people across the Atlantic is what you see in uh, this work, The Black Atlantic by Paul Gilroy. I hope you have got a, an idea of what is victim diaspora. I have given you four or five examples. Then there is the labor diaspora. The most important is uh, the endangered Indians. Uh, Gaitra Bahadur's The Cooley Woman is a very, very important um, book that documents the life of endangered Indians. Labor diasporas were the uh, result of people going to other parts of the world in pursuit of work. Because of this, uh, labor diasporic literature can involve infrastructural development or agricultural work in agricultural plantations. It can be about mining or industrial revolution. It can be about healthcare or working in hospitality industry. A lot of black people uh, and Indians also, Asians also, went abroad as au pair, A-U-P-A-I-R. So these are all um, uh, different aspects of labor diasporic literature. Uh, to give you literary examples, The Grapes of Wrath by John Steinbeck is a very powerful uh, depiction of the dust bowl in America. Uh, during the Great Depression, there was the dust bowl and the immigrant workers from the Oklahoma region, they went to California in search of work. 
these rural immigrant workers and their struggles. That is the theme of Grapes of Wrath. The Jungle by Upton Sinclair is another American work which shows labor diaspora. It uh, talks about the harsh realities of the immigrant workers in the meat packing industry in America. I have already mentioned Brick Lane many times. Brick Lane by Monica Ali provides a glimpse into the life of the Bangladeshi immigrants in London, living in the East End of London, highlighting their struggles and aspirations. Then there is uh, another diaspora, the imperial diaspora. For example, the British coming to India, living here and writing about India. Uh, the most important of them being Rudyard Kipling. Rudyard Kipling is an, in, uh, an Englishman who lived in India and wrote short stories and novels about India. Very pertinent examples being Jungle Book and Kim. Uh, we have also E.M. Foster who wrote A Passage to India. Then also other writers like J.G. Farrell, uh, then M.M. Kai, K.A.Y.E., etc., uh, women and men who have written about India. Some of them have presented uh, the Indian culture or African culture in the negative light, but uh, many of them have also uh, highlighted the uh, problems of colonialism in Indian culture. Heart of Darkness itself can be cited as an example for the ambivalence of imperial diasporic literature. Even as they are empathetic to the colonized people. They are also they also show uh, the hybrid consciousness. They also show the colonial perspectives. Trade diasporas are also there, and also deterritorialized diasporas. Today, uh, in the uh, in the aftermath of globalization, we have an education diaspora. Lots of Indians and people from Asia, etc., going abroad for education. Uh, that has become a very pertinent uh, uh, case of diaspora, but their literature is yet to become a genre in itself. However, Rohinton Mystery, the Parsi Indian writer, Indian uh, Parsi Indian Canadian writer, has written uh, Swimming Lessons, a short story, which is a very famous example of a, a, a an Indian boy living in Canada uh, and experiencing. Canadian culture in, as part of his educational journey and writing a uh, letter back let, letters back to his parents. So such kind of educational diasporic literature is also there. Now, authors of diasporic literature, whether they write about African diaspora or South Asian diaspora or any other community, they uh, are adding a very rich multicolor palette to the landscape of literature. Uh, we all know uh, that uh, diasporic writers include many of the names that I mentioned already, like Salman Rushdie, uh, Bharati Mukherjee, V.S. Nepal. They are first generation, M.G. Vasanji. They are first generation writers. However, we have today uh, later writers, second and third generation diasporic writers like Chitra Banerjee, Divakaruni, Chima Manda Ngozi, Adichi, the Nigerian writer, Jhumpa Lahiri, Junos Dias, the um, American writer, diasporic American, and many others who are, uh, you know, taking diasporic literature forward to new areas. Uh, they explore the intricate connections between memory and displacement, heritage and assimilation, creating a very uh, deeply personal as well as at the same time universal body of literature. Let me discuss some of these writers quickly with you. Salman Rushdie's literary oeuvre uh, spans the East and the West. His works often explore the experiences of characters who navigate multiple cultures. Uh, many of his novels are set in India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Dhaka, uh, then uh, London, all these countries at the same time. His works often explore the experiences of characters who navigate multiple cultures belonging simultaneously nowhere and everywhere. Through a blend of magical realism, we know that that is how he writes. He blends magical realism, historiographic metafiction, 
post-colonial narrative techniques, all that he blends. And uh, he, he has really contributed a lion's share to diasporic literature. Midnight Children serves as a profound exploration of uh, post-colonial identity through Salim Sinai, born at the stroke of midnight on the day of India's independence and endowed with extraordinary powers. In his head, he uh, organizes a conference of uh, all the children born at midnight at the time of India's independence. Thus, allegorically talking about the shifts in the relationships between India, Pakistan and Bangladesh. Rushdie is using Salim Sinai's fragmented and ever-changing identity in the novel as a symbol for the new identities formed within uh, independent India. Another important work by Salman Rushdie is the heavily underrated and uh, banned work, The Satanic Verses, which delves deep. There are two Indian expatriates, Gabriel Farishta and Saladin Chamcha, who are the protagonists of this uh, novel. They miraculously survive a terrorist bombing on a plane that is bound for England. Their subsequent transformations and trials in London uh, address the complexities of the diasporic experience. Another of Shalima, uh, uh, Rushdie's novels is Shalimar the Clown, addressing the themes of love, betrayal, uh, etc. against the backdrop of Kashmir conflict, tracing the journey of the main characters uh, across continents. There are many continents that it is spread. It is similar to Amidav Ghosh's novels today that are spanning uh, many continents at the same time in the, uh, in the trope of a post-colonial journey. So Rajdi's exploration of diasporic experiences extends into the psychological and emotional aspects. It is not only the physical uh, space of diaspora or uh, journey that he talks about. It is psychological journey, characters uh, celebrating their hybrid identities. Jumpa Lahiri is another diasporic writer I would like to mention again. Uh, she, she has written Interpreter of Maladies, uh, Unaccustomed Earth and Lowland. She has won Pulitzer Prize also. And uh, in uh, the namesake, as I've already mentioned, she talks about the struggles of a Bengali couple and uh, their son who is not identifying completely with his parents. Uh, she discusses here notions of identity, tradition, uprooting, family expectations, uh, loss and nostalgia, and uh, how uh, we ultimately have to come to terms with our identities. Uh, the, another writer I would like to mention is Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. She has written a fabulous novel, her third novel called Americana, which is the story of Efemelu, a young Nigerian woman who is emigrating to the United States for education. A lot of Nigerian and African writers have written about people who, uh, who emigrate to the West for education. In Nigeria, they are called the Bean Twos, B-E-E-N-T-O-S. Ifemelu is one such writer. Buchi Emacheda has also written about uh, women emigrating for education and work uh, through novels like The Second Class Citizen. So what are the various stages of their cultural adaptation and how uh, do they develop an intersectional identity? Intersectionality is a concept where it is not one aspect of your identity, but all the aspects, race and uh, disability or ability and gender, everything together making up your identity. That is what is explored in these novels, uh, Chimamad Adichis and Buchi Emachetas. There is the Pakistani writer Mohsin Hamid who wrote Exit West, a compelling narrative that uses magic realism to explore the themes of displacement. Displacement is a very important theme in diasporic literature. Saeed and Nadia, that is the couple the story focuses on, they are fleeing their untamed, war-torn country, uh, going to different parts of the world through some magical doors. That is the theme of Exit West. The novel captures the disorientation 
and loss that is inherent in displacement. Hamid is also delving deep into the psychological ramifications of um, diasporic journeys. Have you heard of Juno's diet? Do not dies. Uh, we brought out an encyclopedia of American literature for which I did extensive research on uh, immigrant writers, diasporic writers in America. And I discovered this amazing writer, Junot Dias, J-U-N-O-T-D-I-A-Z. -E she has, uh, he has written the brief, wondrous life of Oscar Wao, W-A-O. It is an amazing uh, novel that interweaves the family, a family's traumatic history in Dominican Republic under the Truilo dictatorship. There is a dictatorship happening in Dominican Republic and they are searching for identity in a new country, the United States. It's a very brilliantly written novel. Uh, even though uh, Arundhati Roy is not, uh, Arundhati Roy's God of Small Things is not strictly a diasporic novel, um, uh, thank you. Uh, I'm talking about all these writers because of the encyclopedias that we have been writing. So many books we have been reading and um, uh, collecting materials from to put together the encyclopedia. The seven volumes are already over. I think we'll have at least 15 volumes. Um, encyclopedia, uh, contemporary encyclopedia on world literature. That is what we are making because I want everything needed for English literature students and teachers to be in one, one uh, set of books. So we are slowly getting there. So this writer, I was talking about Arundhati Roy. Uh, and also for 25 years, I've been teaching all these things. It is This is the 25th year of my teaching. Um, Arundhati Roy is God of Small Things is also a brilliant uh, tapestry of uh, many issues related to diasporic writing. We all know that the story of God of Small Things orbits around Esther and Rahel. They are twins, they are bizygotic twins. They are very similar to each other and they are coming with their divorced mother Ammu uh, to live in uh, Kerala. From Assam they are coming, leaving their father. And the experiences that they undergo uh, in this changing Kerala, uh, in the times of globalization and next light movement and all that. That is the story of God of Small Things. These uh, no, twins are depicted in two times uh, in two years in the 1960s and 1990s and uh, how globalization has changed Kerala at this time. That is seen very clearly through the uh, traumatized and fragmented experiences of these two uh, children, uh, Rahel and Esther. Roy, Arundhati Roy is using memory as a, not only a narrative uh, device, it is not only a technique of writing, but uh, it is a way to negotiate past traumas and uh, societal norms, memory, how it colors us. Memory as a theme has existed in literature from a long time. Uh, for example, think of Tristram Shandy. It has nothing to do with diasporic literature, but Tristram Shandy uh, uses the theory of empiricism to show that we are our experiences. We are our memories. That idea, what we are today in the present is our memory. It is our past. That idea is very, very much part of modernity, modernism and many other uh, movements of English literature. So memory has been appropriated as a technique in diasporic literature, but it is not only a technique, it is also a way in which characters traverse or negotiate their uh, relationships with present and past traumas and social norms. So displacement um, is a very traumatic experience, but that is for the uh, first generation diasporic writers. For the second generation diasporic writers, displacement all, often denotes or suggests cultural plurality. Let me talk about Zadie Smith, a Caribbean diasporic writer in the United Kingdom. She has written a very important novel, White Teeth, uh, which is a vibrant exploration of cultural plurality in London. 
London is a highly culturally plural space uh, through the intertwining lives of two families, uh, British uh, Bangladeshi Iqbal's and English Jamaican Jones's. Two families are there in white teeth. One is a British Bangladeshi family of the Iqbal's. The other is the English Jamaican Jones's. So that is a very important novel that we should all know and read. She uh, talks about post-colonial Britain and how uh, identity is forged in post-colonial Britain through tension as well as enrichment. Uh, to talk about contemporary uh, cities that are teeming with diasporic populations, we can again talk about Chitra Banerjee Divakaruni. She has notable works like The Mistress of Spices, Sister of My Heart, The Wine of Desire, Before We Visit the Goddess, and recently Independence. They're all uh, important works that navigate between cultures of their native as well as adopted lands. In The Mistress of Spices, Divakarani is using magic realism to show Tilo, an immigrant from India, who is running a spice shop in California. And she uses magic realism. The spices are eventually trying to take revenge upon her. But she uh, joins with the with her American boyfriend. She lets go her tra ethnic tradition to some extent when it starts to uh, eat into her identity. And she joins with her American boyfriend and forges a new identity and escapes from the spices. That is a very um, good message that uh, the in uh, immigrants can get from this novel. Sister of My Heart uh, and its sequel, Wine of Desire, also talk about... Um, people who are moving to America, the joys and challenges that they experience there and the, how they are portraying emotional and physical distances. I am, I, I, I am, um, you know, I, I am uh, amused by the coincidence. Uh, today is 30th March. On the 2nd of April, I am going to uh, the United States to present a paper I'm going to Orlando in Florida to present a paper. And it is so good that I am presenting this paper on diasporic experiences. I will carry these authors, these texts that we discussed today with me. It is only a short journey that I'm taking. I will come back in a week. Uh, and then after that, on April 18th, uh, we are doing an amazing experiment, traveling to the UK for 20 days and teaching from live locations there. That is also something very deeply connected to diasporic experiences. Uh, we will have, we will go to the United States, take a road trip across the United States from one end to the other and uh, go to all the places that are depicted in British literature and uh, teach about those places from there. You know, it will be a terrific um, experience for not only the travelers, but also the virtual travelers who attend the course from here. These are all experiments that are made possible uh, because of all these writers who inspired us, who ignited a fire in our minds. We want to know these places. Every one of us want to travel and go to all these places. And it is becoming increasingly easy also. So I'm, uh, I'm, I'm intrigued by this coincidence. Before We Visit the Goddess is another uh, important book by uh, Chitra Banerjee Divakarani that I want you to look at. It also shows immigrant experiences. So today, uh, to wind up, uh, diasporic literature embraces many developments. It is not just one thing anymore. So many new changes have come. For example, globalization has brought new changes. And today we talk about digital diasporas. Anybody who is looking for research topics can think of this also. Digital diasporic literature is there. It refers to uh, uh, you know, online communities where they come together and write in Twitter, Facebook, etc., Twitter or X and Facebook, etc. There are magazines that bring together diasporic writers online. The diaspora itself is a very major magazine. And also many individuals through their blogs and personal websites, etc., have been sharing migration stories, cultural reflections. So digital diasporic literature is a research area where um, you can find some good research topics. There are also artists 
who have done a lot of diasporic uh, work online, that is also a very important area, the, the diasporic art. Examining diasporic literature helps us to understand how important storytelling is for our is for preserving our cultural traditions. All these diasporic writers, um, uh, they tell stories of their past, of their cultures to keep their memories alive. These stories act as archives. They are historical documents. They are archives of customs and traditions, and uh, th those might be otherwise lost uh, for the future generations. So these communities with their storytelling di through diasporic literature establish a worldwide existence, recovering their narratives and past and combating present realities through literature. Uh, the greatest thing about diasporic literature is its amazing diversity and uh, the intercultural understanding and tolerance that it promotes. Uh, words have the ability to heal divisions in a world where people are fighting and killing each other and uh, attacking each other in terms of differences. Diasporic literature has the power to heal, to bring uh, solutions also, uh, to bring the human, uh, human world together. So diasporic literature is a testament to the resilience and creativity of the human spirit. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, ma'am, for giving us a very wonderful session on the diasporic literature from the beginning of the uh, Greco-Roman period from uh, to the to the contemporary period. And really, it is. I was uh, uh, like in heaven. I was thinking that I'm in Kerala and I'm sitting in front of you and listening to you once again. I'm attending your class. Really, the way you teach, the way you speak, the way you explain, and the way you tell us the idea. Really, it's a very wonderful, very nice, and uh, I can't. I can't express your thanks in words. Thank you. I, I I know you that really. Uh, you have uh, put a light on each and every aspect of uh, diasporic literature from the power, the some uh, types of diasporic literature from the uh, which are the uh, uh, what we what you call that uh, the phrases of uh, phases of the liter diasporic literature. In the first phase, there was the uh, Chitra uh, later later was there Chitra Banerjee Akhani. Before that, V S Naipaul was there, Rusty was there, and you you really uh, uh, took uh, told us the very nicely, very deeply, and you have uh, clear our concept about uh, diaspora literature. I, re I I have read so many things on diaspora literature, but today I uh, uh, clearly uh, you have cleared my idea about diasporic literature. Not only mine, but each and every participants, those who have participated. Right? Uh, I am very much thankful to ma'am for accepting our invitation and giving uh, time for my college uh, uh, from your two, two busy schedule, not only busy, just two busy schedule. I know that you are too busy in your work. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much once again. Thank you, you ma'am. Thank you. Now, uh, we are moving to the other part of this uh, conference. Uh, ma'am, if you have work, you can do. Uh, Thank as you, you wish. very much, dear friends. Bye. If you want to stay here, you can stay. Yeah. I have actually yeah. another meeting. I, I would like to leave. I know that you are too busy. Uh, we, we are having some people, uh, participants, they are going to present their okay. research paper. Uh, thank you. Then if, if you are all the best can... to all of you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Your wishes are al uh, always with me. Your blessings are always with me. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much for giving your uh, time. And thank you. Thank you so much. Now we are moving to the other part of this conference. Uh, first, I would like to call Dr. Uh, so, sorry, Dr. Shubhangi Nilangikar uh, to present her research paper. Are you there, Shubhangi, ma'am? And now you can unmute yourself and you can speak. Uh, Shubhangi, ma'am, are you there? Appa Lunde? Yes, sir. Yes, yes, yeah. sir. Yes, you present your paper, sir. Okay, thank you so much, sir. 
My name is Appa Ramchandra Londe, Head Department of English, Lake TD Patare, Arts, Commerce and Science College, Chandan Nagar, Pune. The title of my research paper is Identity Crisis in Diaspora Literature. Leaving a native country for various reasons is nor normal for even common people today. The percentage of immigrants have been increased drastically since last few years. People living outside their native countries naturally have emotional attachment with their motherland. Some of them express their love for their native country, their problems to settle in foreign land, and their struggle for self-identity in foreign country in literary works. These literary works are known as diaspora. This research paper aims at examining identity crisis in some major diasporic literary works. The study attempts to describe the identity crisis experienced by major by protagonists and other major characters. Textual as well as character analysis has been used as a research method for this study. The study explains how the protagonists and other major characters struggle for self-identity. The research paper will help to understand one of the major theme of diaspora literature that is identity crisis. A diaspora is a group of people that scattered elsewhere from their geographic place of origin. The term diaspora is derived from the Greek word meaning scattering. The term diaspora literature is referred to the literary works written by the authors who are living outside their native country, but their works are closely related with their, their native culture and background. So in other words, works that are written by the authors who live outside their native country are known as diaspora literature. The major themes of diaspora literature are feeling of alienation, the quest for identity, homesickness, identity crisis, sense of guilt, etc. Some of the diaspora writers return to their native country for various reasons. So identity crisis is the one of the major themes that one can come across in almost every diasporic literary work. Here are some major diasporic literary works analyze in which identity crisis plays a vital role to develop the plot of the important diasporic work. First, A House for Mr. Biswas. The novel is written by V.S. Naipaul. Mr. Biswas, the protagonist of the novel, has to marry his client's daughter, Shama, and he becomes the member of Tulsi household. Mr. Biswas is not happy with his wife, Shama. He is given a subordinate place in his family. He becomes her jamai. Can you listen me? I, am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Go ahead. You are you are okay. 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 But Mr. Biswas wants to identify himself. He wants to be free. He wants to take his own decisions. But the Tulsis did not allow him to do so. Mr. Biswas wishes to live in his own house. So he attempts several times to build his own house. Struggle of Mr. Biswas to build his own house is linked to an individual's desire to develop an authentic identity. Mr. Biswas feels that he can overcome his alienation and loneliness by living in his own house. Second work, we need new names. It is one of the best novels written by Violet Bulawayo, who is a Zimbabwean author living in America. The story is centered on Darling, a young girl. We need new names. Begins with Darling and her friends searching for was in the rich neighborhood called Budapest. Darling and her friends, Chipo, Stina, do not have their own identity. They struggle to live. They feel that their position in society as marginalized individuals. They feel that they may never live luxurious life like Budapest. They think that they do not have identity in society. They decide to have their own country in search of their own identity identities where they will have their own status identity food and will never have to sleep with empty stomach but it was not happen at all when darling along with her friends reached to america they are unable to fit in the life over there they do not feel safe and comfortable there in america they are not able to establish their own identity in america darling a protagonist is living with her aunt Fostelina in america Darling somehow consumes American culture by watching TV and aping people from her school, but she eventually feels that this is not her true self. She struggles to identify herself. She struggles to establish identity among 
American society and even within herself, she is unable to find a safe space for herself. Darling yearn to return her motherland, but she also afraid to go her motherland. She feels that her country is not her home anymore. Darling says in the novel, we loved our prison. It was not a bad prison. And when things only got worse in our country, we pulled our shackles even tighter and said, we are not leaving America. No, we are not leaving. Page number 293. The protagonist darling realizes that she will never realize her strengths and potential because she is not getting opportunities to prove herself. Excuse me, excuse me. Excuse me. Excuse me, Londa, sir. Please yes, go sir. on through, go on, uh, don't go through entire paper. Please um, just present your abstract. Okay, okay, sir. Don't don't go through entire paper because we don't have that that much time. With there are so okay, many sir, people sir, are waiting. They, they want to also present. Okay, uh, okay, sir. At at sharp six o'clock we have to end the meeting. Okay. Yes, yes. Take okay. So some of the purpose of this study is to understand and examine one of the major themes that has influenced diaspora literature, that is identity crisis. The study shows that the identity crisis occurs because diasporic individuals feel homesickness about their home country and they long for it. As they have born and brought up in their homeland, naturally they have emotional attachment and love for their homeland. That is why they face serious problems to adopt foreign culture. They feel alienated in foreign culture. The immigrants want to prove their caliber and grab opportunities to establish their own identity in foreign culture, but they develop detachment about foreign culture in their subconscious mind, due to which they long and yearn to return to their native country. That's it, sir. I would like to thank Kanivera Dr. Anand Somuse, Head Department of English, and my special thanks to Dr. Prabhakar Swami, organizer and the IQAC coordinator for providing such uh, providing us such a platform to show our caliber. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Uh, thank you. You have presented you nicely your paper. I have read your whole paper and really you have nicely uh, composed, uh, written your research paper. Thank you so much. Now thank I would you. like to... Dr. Uh, Shubhangi Nilangekar, ma'am. Are you there, ma'am? Shubhangi, ma'am. Or anyone who is, have, who is here or who want to present their research paper, they can unmute and present their paper. Uh, excuse okay. me, sir. Good evening. Yes, yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, this is uh, Brinda uh, speaking from Mysore MMK SDM College and uh, Chodi, a co-author on the paper and uh, paper presented in the name of uh, Ujwala Shetty. We would like to present our paper. Can we go ahead? Yes, yes, ma'am. Yes, go ahead. Yes. Uh, the topic that we have chosen for uh, today's paper presentation is Exploring Literary Poetics, a Brief Study of K. Krishnamurti Impactful Contribution. As we have planned, as we have uh, author and co-author, I will be giving an introduction and the later part will be explained by my author, uh, Ujwala Shetty. As we have said, uh, the very topic says that exploring literary poetics, a brief study of Krishnamurti's impactful contribution. In introduction, we would like to introduce what is literary poetics. A literary poetics refers to the study and analysis of the principal structure and forms that governs literary works, particularly poetry. It involves examining the devices, technique and styles employed by writer to convey meaning and evoke emotions in their works. Poetics explores the aesthetic and linguistic aspects of literature, seeking to understand how writers use language, rhythm, imagery and the other elements to create uh, uh, artistic and expressive compositions. Literary poetics in English uh, rooted in classical theories gained prominence with Aristotle poetics, which explored the nature and the principle of poetry. It encompasses the analysis of poetic language, structure and aesthetics. Formalism, a 20th century movement, emphasized the intrinsic features of literary texts influencing poetic structuralism like uh, Ronald Barthes extended these ideas. Post-structuralist, including uh, Jack Derrida, challenged fixed meaning, imparting poetic 
uh, imparting poetic contemporary approaches such as new criticism and reader responses theory contribute to ongoing discussion on literary poetics yeah. reflecting a diverse perspective in the study of the poetry and uh, so there is a disturbance uh, anything else sir no 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 just just go ahead uh, okay, okay. And uh, uh, if we think, uh, I'll just try to give an history of a Sanskrit literary poet later on. My co-author, I mean, my author is going to take up on the uh, on the paper. If we talk about the brief history of Sanskrit literary poetics uh, on exploring literary poetics, if we think of a Sanskrit literary poetics, Sanskrit begin with the aesthetic text Natya Shastra, attributed to the sage Bharata, composed yes. around. Hey. Composed around the second yes. century BC to second century CE, and the aesthetic in the Indian classical and the Natya Shastra is a foundational treatise on the Indian performing art and aesthetic. It comprises that is its chapter covering various aspects of drama, including plot construction, characterization, emotions, and the stage design. Bharatamuni, the attributed author, explored the concept of rasa, referring to the emotional essence experienced by the audience. The text also deviles into the classification of the poetry, the role of different. Uh, performing art element in evoking specific emotion. Overall, the Natya Shastra has significantly influenced classical Indian literature and performing arts. In India, during the colonial period, led to an indisputable fact that it also bred a, a host of uh, exceptional bilingual scholars spurred by William Jones' article on comparative linguistic, who dedicated their lives to the study of Sanskrit language and literature from a non-traditional perspective Orientalist in England and Europe, transcendentalist in the US and the new Germanians in Germany. These scholars collected, edited, and published old Sanskrit texts, both secular and sacred, and interpreted them from a modern point of view. Also, since the language of analysis and interpretation was more often than not English, its uh, intent read readership was both the pan Indian and international. This period often recognized as the Renaissance of Sanskrit, and some of the great Indian scholars who worked in this Renaissance period were Dr. R.G. Uh, Bandarkar and uh, many other uh, writers. Uh, Dr. Kerala Puram Krishnamurti belongs to this great line of uh, scholars, and uh, the next part will be continued by my uh, author, Ujjwala Shetty. <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. Now, is there anyone who wants to present this uh, the research paper? That this will be the last person. Very good evening. I want to represent my paper. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, everyone. Yeah, yes, ma'am. Yes, Ujjwala, ma'am. Please go ahead. Ah, thank you, sir. My co-author, my HOD, has been given a de deep discussion, uh, explanation on uh, literary poetics and uh, literary, how literature will relate to the humankind. Thank you, ma'am. I'll continue with the diaspora, refers, uh, referring to the dis uh, dispersion and scattering of the people. My topic is on... Resilience across the border, feminist diasporic narratives in Bapsi Sidwa's Ice Candy Man. Uh, so this has been uh, discussed with uh, myself and my Hachori Brinda ma'am. And in this paper, he intends to study the diasporic feminine elements in partition novel Ice Candy Man by Bapsi Sidwa. Ice Candy Man emerges. Uh, I, am I audible, sir? Can I continue? Yes, yes, ma'am. Please continue. You are audible. Oh, thank you. Thank you, sir. Ice Candy Man emerges as a compelling narrative that not only dwells into the complexities of diasporic identity, but also serves as a significant contribution to feminist literature. This paper undertakes an analysis of Sidwa's portrayal of female character navigating to the in intersecting ideas of gender, culture, and displacement. An, uh, through an exploration of a protagonist, Lenny, 
and other female voice within the novel this study investigates the ways which sidwas interrogates the patriarchal structure and challenges traditional gender roles admits with the backdrop of partition period in india through the feminist theory to analyze the character agency resistance and subversions of a societal norms this study make us to examine the novel significance in explaining marginalized voice and advocating the gender equality within the context of diasporic literature as we all people know that diaspora refers to the scattering of the people from their original homeland to the other part of the world diaspora literature in english refers to the literary work that is written by author who belongs to diaspora community but in this ice candy man which is also been known as a cracking india written by bopsi sidwa can be considered as a diasporic novel novel while it is not directly about the experience of immigrants or their discontents living in a foreign land it portrays the partition of india and resulting displacement and fragmentations of communities the novel explores the themes of identity belonging and cultural hybridity through the lens of characters that are impacted by the partition history additionally bapsi sidwa herself a member of parsi community which is a diaspora group with roots of roots in persia and now it is scattered across the globe further adding to the diasporic aspects of the novel with the lenis uh, bapsi sidwa no, please please ma'am please please do do it in a, in a brief because we don't have that much time no, only sir, 11 sir, minutes are left in a concluding line by uh, explaining myself to, to the characters how they are uh, being diasporic in the uh, bapsi sidwa's novel just in a few seconds i'll complete sir okay 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 sir in our observation as my hachori brinda ma'am and we studied this uh, novel um we thought that in bapsi sidwa's novel as candy man can be inter uh, interpreted as a diasporic feminism novel due to the exploration of the gender dynamics identity and resilience within the context of dia diaspora the novel examines the interesting ident intersecting identities of in characters in the including gender religion social class highlighting the complexities of their experience through the characters like aya and shanta who navigates the challenges of being women in patriarchal society for example where in a character called uh, lenny the young parsi girl at the heart of narrative reflects the challenges of navigating identity in a face of displacement lenny's fragmented sense belonging in evident observation she, she said in a novel she her quotes is my school friends have all gone away and the house is empty except for us we have lost our home and all our friends here lenny grapples with the loss of her familiar surroundings and social connection highlighting the deorienting impact on displacement on the personal identity this novel i can demand as it is a diasporic novel it gives importance to the feminism and also it tells it gives the women agency in this novel as we can see in aya's uh, uh, character where shidwa exposes the intersecting dynamics gender and the power within the patriarchal structure aya's re silence in ex exemplified in her defense against social societal norms she asserts her agency in her own path her uh, her uh, words are like this i don't want to marry i want to work and stand on my own foot so this is what we can see a diasporic partition novel can be considered in a diasporic feminine novel so it is a best novel to see the characters how they are being uh, projected with the women's agency the second character one more character is there that is shanta serves as a fragment representation of resilience in the face of trauma 
Shanta's howling experience during the partition level in evidential mark on her psyche. She, uh, she's the art lady where she can say that when I pa paint, I forget everything. I feel free. So these are the two, Aya, Shanta and Lini are being diasporic because of this partition thing. But they are in a women's agency where they come out of their restrictions, societal norms, and they put their effort to be themselves. This is what we can see in a diasporic novel. So on concluding my words, uh, I feel ultimately Ice Candy Man stands a testament to, to the resilience of marginalized voice and the trans formative power of storytelling in confronting social justice and advocating the gender equality within diasporic communities. Through the compelling narratives and Nan's character portrayal, the novel continues renounced with the reader, offering valuable insights in the intercession dynamics of diasporic and feminist identity. Thank you, sir. Thank you for the opportunity. And I thank Brinda ma'am for helping me. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Now I would like to request Dr. Uh, Shubhangi Nilangekar, ma'am, to present her research paper. In a brief, please, we don't have uh, that much time. Please go in brief. Yeah. Shubhangi, ma'am. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, sir. Good evening. Good evening. Yes. I'm audible. Yes, yes ma'am. You are audible. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, good evening. Myself, Shubhangi Nilangekar. I'm the research scholar. I'm not full of flesh, flesh and cultural studies. It's okay, ma'am. No. Nay, Tundra, Rachu. Hello. Yes, ma'am. Go ahead. Yeah. Research scholar of School of Literature and Cultural Studies in Nandar. And my guide, Phoebe Bhangesar. So my a little mirror of society, traditions, cultures, life practices, issues, and challenges, and concern of the contemporary society. It has a rich heritage of human civilization. The Indian society has evolved in due course of time. Similarly, the Indian li English literature also covered various themes. The literature, literature is one of the most emerging part of Indian writing in English. It aims to depict the social issues, discrimination, appreciation, suffering, and psychoanalysis treatment by the dominant for the socially and economically backward classes. The present article aims to explore and analyze the various themes covered in the major library works related to the lit literature in Indian English. Mulukraj Anand, Dr. Narendra Jadav, Urmila Pawar, Bhama, Meena, Kanda Swami and others have a major deal of contribution to the Dalit literature in Indian English. It is noteworthy to mention that the majority of the Dalit works were created in a regional language like Marathi, Punjabi, Tamil and ETC. Then <coughs> they were translated into English. It found that the not Notable Dalit literature covers the themes such as untouchability, racial caste, discrimination, exploitation of women, treatment, keeping the backward classes away from the fundamental rights, man and woman relationship, quest for identity and their struggle for the existence. It helps the reader in understanding the contemporary society, social issues and rising the price for the equality right opportunities. Background of the study, the study of the literature in Indian English has its root deeply into social, political and cultural fabric in India. The term Dalit refers to those who have been historically marginalized and approached in the Indian caste system and formerly known as untouchables. In emergence of Dalit literature in Indian English can be traced back to the mid 
20th century which the works of pioneers in right authors like a mulukraj anand who explores the struggles and aspirations of the dalit community in the in their writing however it was during the late 20th century that dalit literature gained significance intention and recognition as a distinct literature genre knowing the efforts of writers such as om prakash valmiki bama and daya pawar who provided authentic authentic voice uh, to the dalit experience through their narrative narratives the significance of study importance and contributions of the dalit literature in indian writing in english cannot be overstated as the offers the unique preservative and on the experience of historical marginalized community within the indian context dalit literature serves the powerful tools for the social critics and challenging dominating narratives or advocating for the social justice and equality by foregrounding the voices and experience of dalit it sheds light on the uh, injustice of the caste system and uh, highlights the relations and agency of the oppressed the objectives of the study the study of st the study the literature within a context of indian writing in english to analyze the various themes or covered in the dalit literature in indian literature to explore the various perspective related to dalit li literature in india uh, review of literature in the part of review literature uh, according to nayar dalit literature in indian english literature often resolved around the themes of empowerment and assertions of identity authors like mahashweta devi and arundhati roy depict the dalit uh, pro protagon became ma'am please Dekhi. please go in brief please yes yes okay sir okay sir now i am going to concluding my part so all of the above discussion shows the indian writing in english is a vivid and diverse in nature it deals with wide variety of forms genres themes settings narratives and translation styles etc it travels from local to global providing the glimpse to the readers of india and abroad dalit literature is one of the most notable forms of indian writing in english it has gained the uh, momentum after the indian independence men and women youth have been reading writing and experience their ideas through constitutional rights it is a step towards the strengthening india democracy in a true spirits and thank you for the present my paper thank you for the opportunities uh thank you so much ma'am uh, now i would like to request to ashok bhosikar sir to present his uh, research paper ashok bhosikar sir are you there yes sir yes yes i am am i audible yeah, sir please yes sir yes sir you are audible, audible? please yes. please uh, present in a yeah, brief I will read because, just because it al already it is too late because 6 o'clock we have to continue the meeting but uh, as per the, as the permission with my uh, honorable dr bhar wood the principal sir i have to call it 10 minutes uh, extended this for this meeting yes, please yes, yes, uh, yes. do in a brief yes 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 sure sir yeah uh, okay, first of you. all thank you very much for giving me this opportunity and congratulation to dr prabhakar swami sir for organizing such a wonderful seminar on very important topic uh, the title of my paper is the diasporic perception in amitav ghosh the circle of reason and the glass palace uh, this is ashok bhosikar assistant professor department of english shivaji arts commerce and science college kannad uh, district chhatrapati sambhajinagar i am going to read out just the abstract india has produced many talented writers who serve as a source inspiration to the eminent generation the writers give us a picture of indian society and they also cover different issues including the various problems faced by indian people the scattering of populations and cultures across various geographical places and spaces examines the diasporic study the global indian diaspora today says plays a significant role in socio economic and political sphere of host countries the international organization for migration provides a broad definition of diaspora as members of ethnic and national communities who have left but maintain links with their homelands the term diaspora conveys the idea of transnational populations living in one place while still maintaining relations with their homelands the present research paper emphasizes the diasporic view 
through the characters in the novels of Amitav Ghosh. Amitav Ghosh highlights the dislocation of people of depression and existential rootlessness in his debut novel, The Circle of Reason. The disturbed mental condition of the displaced immigrants viewed throughout the novel. The characters in the novel are forced to accept the cultural displacement, but the state of migrants remains problematic as they are just not able to delete the memory of their native land from their mind. Amitav Ghosh undertakes a journey of examining reasons for the diasporic consciousness of human beings through his novels. In The Glass Palace, Ghosh writes about the predicament of migrants. The novel covers the sad episodes of the last king of Burma and his doomed family that is exiled to Ratnagiri in India. In the study of Ghosh novel, The Circle of Reason and The Shadow Lines, we can say that Amitav Ghosh mentions the different diasporic vista in the early Indian diaspora. The main aspect of the novel is the loss of homeland, national and cultural identity, and subaltern consciousness because of migration, how the laborers try to find a new identity in foreign land. Thanks a lot, sir. Prabhakar Swami, sir. This is all from my side. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, now I would like to request. Uh, uh, is there anybody who wants to present his paper? Ah, sir, it's or me, Rorge, Rorge Shunanda. Hello, sir. Yes, yes, ma'am. Yes. Now I'd like I would like to request to Rorge Shunanda, ma'am, to present the paper and see and th see the last person. After that, please, uh, everybody, those who have sent the paper and they are registered, and those who have paid the fees for this conference, they all will get the paper presentation certificate. Okay. That's it. That okay, is the charity from my side. Okay. Thank you Please so present. much. You are the last. Then, uh, then Dr. Anand Somit, sir, the head of the Department of English, he will be present out of thanks after you. Okay, sir. Thank you. Good evening to one and all. Uh, today, my topic is that diaspora literature and Zumpa Lari. I'm very much thankful to the Department of Lingao, to Swami, sir, and to the all authorities for uh, choosing such a wonderful and sensitive topic for this e-conference. So that diaspora nowadays is a very sensitive word as it self explains that diaspora means to sow throughout or to scatter about or abroad. Nowadays, as just uh, before few minutes, ma'am has uh, spoken, there are many types of diasporas, victim diaspora, imperial diaspora, labor diaspora, trade diaspora and cultural diaspora, etc. But see, I think that it is not just the types which we do study. It is what that, though whatever the themes are there, those all themes are related to us. Let it be nostalgia, dislocation, discrimination, survival, search of identity, cultural change and crisis, whatever it may be. One of the persons says that all diasporas are unhappy, but every diaspora is unhappy in its own way. What in definition? Vijay Mishra says that, the whatever definition just added that all diasporas are unhappy, but every diaspora is unhappy in its own way. Diaspora refers to the people who do not feel comfortable with their non hypogenated identities as indicated on their passport. So this is what Vijay Mishra has explained. And I think that Zumpaleri is not unknown to anyone. She has explained a lot. She has contributed a lot to diaspora literature. I especially am a research scholar who is uh, studying with the same thing that theorizing diaspora literature is study of Zumpa Lari, Nilanjana Sudesh Nalheri, American born Indian to the writer, very famous one. And she her work, I have mentioned that interpreter of Maladis, this is a short story collection for whom she has got many awards and uh, medals. This is the collection of nine short stories, Temporary Matter. When Mr. Miranda comes to dine, Interpreter of Maladis, this is the story of Mr. Kapsi and that's family. Ariel Durwan, Sexy, Mrs. Sane, This Blazed House, and all. Especially, I like that the low land. This is the study of Ashoka and Udayan. And uh, it is the study of the cultural crisis where these two brothers fight for that. And uh, uh, then I have gone to the unaccustomed art where we have seen love, loss, loneliness and search for belongingness. Hell heaven, a choice of accommodation, only goodness, nobody's business, 
these are the famous short stories from that and one of the very touching story from that is what that ruma the story of one of the daughters who really fights with her own father and this is what just about my all studies and paper as sir said it is it must be very short so in a very short way i tried to explain thank you so thank much you, ma sir. really your paper is very nice i have uh, gone through your whole paper uh, really you, you are nicely uh, put uh, with the hypothesis uh, your paper now yeah. i would like to request with the veera veera basawa uh, yeah, yeah. sir is the sir will be the last person who present this paper uh, present his research paper please present in within a 2 or 3 minutes thank you sir thank you ma'am yeah, yeah, yes sir yes sir I yes sir just, yeah, go ahead just go through only uh, abstract sir myself and veera basawa is one of the scholar department of english my topic is cultural conflicts in diaspora literature just i'm going through only abstract people are identified by their culture basically when we know the new culture it will enrich our knowledge but adopting the same and living in an alien land will affect our freedom of thought and life folks move from one place to another for all kind of betterment change of where abouts and language from one to other drag the people to further complicated world they drop all their hopes towards the newness and try to adjust or struggle for their life in the unexpected circumstances man brooker sorry man man booker prize winner a famous indian diaspora writer kiran desai's one of the famous novel the hin aryans of loss discusses different kind of losses take place by man's displacement the characters we can see in this novel bizu sai and bela represent the pain and affection of uh, departs they are longing for identity and want to create a comfort zone in the alien soil lands and uh, frustrated and one more uh, the famous novel the namesake uh, who is written by jumbal hari the she was also one of the famous and uh, uh philister uh, fries winner put across the same sensibility in a novel the namesake the protagonist of this novel we can see gogel and others ashok asmus migrate to another country still wants to flow their culture and traditional values there these novels stress the con- concept of uh, cultural identity with rootlessness and uh, ancestor expectation the present paper deals about this uh, these two novels uh, we can see the main uh, the anita desai's novel the innocence of loss and one more is uh, jumpalari's novel is the namesake this is what this no these two novels we can see the cultural conflict in uh, diaspora literature still we have but uh, just uh, for a uh, 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 sake of time i gone through only abstract thank you for uh, Uh, giving this opportunity to present my paper and uh, thanks to who has organized this uh, conference uh, prabhu swami sir and uh, his whole team thank you very much sir uh, thank you thank you so much bashwa raju for concluding your nice paper because i have gone through all your paper i have read all the paper and really you have put all the things very nicely about these two novels in your research paper uh, recently you. our honorable dr Uh, principal dr br borke sir he has sent a message to this conference uh, he has wrote in his message i heartily congratulate to the whole team of this conference or organizing advisory committee and the whole team dr prabhakar swami has edited uh, uh, organized this conference will prove to be highly useful for researchers and students of both diaspora studies and post colonial literature and arts and merits a high recommendation as an addition to library collections of diaspora as well as literary and cultural studies thank you so much to the our principal sir for giving your uh, nice message and always giving blessings us uh, about to organize like uh, nice conferences thank you thank you so much sir now i would like to request dr uh, anand somuse sir head of the department english uh, for to present our top thanks after that after this there will be national anthem and the uh, seminar will be concluded uh, head of the department dr anand somuse sir please may present may i add one yes yes sir yes sir 
I extremely sorry because uh, I could not do very well introducing introduction of uh, Dr. Kalani Ma'am due to the poor connectivity in the uh, in the first session. Now I am doing uh, here vote of thanks. This is the last phase of this uh, conference. Good evening to all. <clears throat> Respected uh, Chairperson Dr. Uh, v. R. Borke, sir, Principal of my college. Esteemed inaugurator Dr. Kalani Ma'am <clears throat> and all the uh, participants. We behalf of the organizing committee, it gives me immense pleasure to extend our heartfelt uh, gratitude, uh, gratitude to each and every one <clears throat> of you for gracing us with your presence. First and foremost, our sincere appreciation goes to honorable Dr. B. R. Borke, sir, for his unwearying support and guidance. Thank you, sir. We extend our sincere thanks to Dr. Kalyani Ma'am for inaugur inaugurating this uh, conference and for sharing her insights on diasporic literature. Thank you, Mom. Uh, your <clears throat> profound knowledge and expertise in this uh, field have enlightened us. But uh, last but not least, we express our gratitude, Dr. Dr. Baban Burke, sir, chairperson of this conference, for joining here. Your presence adds immense value to our conference, and we are grateful uh, for your continued support and encouragement. And sincere thanks to those participants who, who presented their papers very well here. <clears throat> I would uh, also like to extend our thanks to all the participants and my colleagues who have contributed to the success of this event. Your dedication and enthusiasm are truly uh, commentable. Thank you uh, once uh, again to everyone for making this conference successful. Uh, with the permission of your person, I declare here <clears throat> this conference will be concluded. Thank you, sir. After after the national anthem, please uh, stand at your places. Where are you? Uh... जय गण मन अधिनायक जय हे भारत भाग्य विधाता पंजाब सिंध गुजरात मराठा द्राविड उत्कल बंगा भिंज हिमाचल यमुना गंगा उच्चल जलधि तरंगा तव शुभ नामे जागे तव शुभ आशीष मागे गाहे तव जय गाधा जन गण मंगल दायक जय हे भारत भाग्य विधाता जय हे जय हे जय हे with the permission of chair i conclude here the meeting is over and once again i am very much thankful to each and every participant those who have participated in this conference uh, here is one official announcement is one here uh, all the research paper have been those who have sent the research paper uh, before 20th March, uh, those papers have been published in our book. Uh, book will be, uh, is going to binding. Uh, it will be get us in on 15th April and it will be sent uh, to each and everyone's uh, postal address uh, to before uh, 20th April. Thank you. Thank you so much once again for being with us, joining this conference and making uh, success this conference. The feedback link will be shared in the diaspora group, uh, WhatsApp group. Please uh, 